and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Collins, back in studio. And today, though, it's a bit of a misnomer because we're not going to be talking about Beacon Hill issues. We're going to talk about national issues. We have a candidate for Congress in studio today. His name is Tom Simmons. He is a professor of economy, economics actually, and business at Greenfield Community College. And I got to tell you, I have looked forward to this interview for quite a while. And so have I. And I'll tell you why. Because you, you, my wife took one of your online courses, a couple of them actually. And I think you might even be her advisor. And, you know, I haven't sat through a seminar since I got out of college low these many years ago. And it takes a lot to get me to want to sit down and watch anything that has to do with academia if I don't have to, right? But I would sit there and I would watch your, your lectures with her because I just found you really compelling and you made some good points. And she would always talk about her assignments with me. And so we got to be friends on Facebook. And ever since, I've been dying to get you in here. And now we have a reason to have you in here because you are running against Congressman Richie Neal in the 1st Congressional District. You're running as a libertarian. So the first question, Professor, is why would you run for this job? I think it's a, a perfect storm of both personal and public events that are happening right now. On a personal level, I'm ending 18 years of teaching economics and business. I'm, I'm looking forward to retirement. But anyone who knows me knows that as soon as I, I free up a little time, I fill it with something else because that's just the kind of guy I am. Um, so on a personal level, I've always, been involved in I've always been involved to some degree in politics, following politics. It's hard to teach economics and business without keeping your thumb on political issues. And at the same time, nationally and locally, um, there, I think this year more than any year, there's been an incredible groundswell of people that are just tired of what they see coming out of Washington. Um, tired of um, the same answers, tired of the same people who have been there 20, 30 years, tired of being told one thing and, uh, and having that person deliver something entirely different, the bait and switch. Mm -hmm. You see it in the Republican Party with those who have embraced Trump. You see it in the Democratic Party with those who have embraced Sanders. Um, and now we have a candidate who, um, an incumbent who has been entrenched for over 26 years, who rarely has opposition. opposition. Uh, and I disagree with him on a number of issues. So now is the time to say, no, you're not getting away with this anymore. And we're going to talk about some of those issues, including the one big one that got you really fired up, which was the standardized testing thing. But let's talk about the district. You live in Shelburne Falls. Now, Technically, FCAT is in the second district with uh, Jim McGovern. So the people listening aren't going to be able to vote for you. However, we have a large YouTube audience, and I'm hoping some of the first district voters will go to YouTube and check out this interview so they can find out what you're about. But that is a weird district. It's a very weird district. And when the districts were recreated uh, after reapportionment, it should have been called the Incumbent Protection Act. <laughs> yeah. uh, because my district is an L. It, it does not include any of the valley towns yeah. between Greenfield and Northampton. Uh, but then it goes down to the Connecticut line and follows it all the way out to Rhode Island. So it's, it's kind of, a, of an L-shaped district. Um, it cuts Franklin County in half. It cuts Hampshire County in half. It, it wasn't designed with the residents in mind. What else is new? <laughs> it was designed with preserving certain people's political careers. And the hub for that district, the area with the largest concentration of voters is in Hamden County in Springfield. Absolutely. Just right in Neil's backyard. Right. He's the former mayor, of course. And, and I've, you know, I've covered Richie off and on over the years, and he strikes me as a guy who, you know, he has seniority and he still seems like he's focused on issues, but I think there are people that feel like he's been at the dance a little too long. Do you agree? Well, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm running. Um, he, again, 26 years in Congress alone, the, the, the votes that he's taken have been very, very uh, pro-corporate, um, they, they tend to ignore what uh, the voters in his district uh, are looking for. I mean, this is a district that voted two to three to one for Bernie Sanders over Hillary yeah. Clinton, and he came out right from the beginning, oh, no, I'm a Hillary Clinton delegate, um, and didn't really care what the voters of the district thought. And when you're sitting somewhere for 26 years and you have no opposition and you just assume it's, it's your kingdom, uh, you know, that, that begins to become part of, of your mindset. Well, you know the old saying, and it takes three things to win in politics, money, money, and more money. And as a new candidate, a libertarian, going up against an entrenched incumbent with large ties to corporations, doesn't that put you in at a disadvantage in terms of fundraising right out of the jump? It absolutely puts me at a disadvantage. I'm going to have to spend most of my summer 
door to door, person to person, getting my name out, uh, using social media, uh, because I don't have that kind of money. I just don't have it. Um, but from what I have heard so far in talking to people, um, the, uh, the anger is palpable out there. Really? And people are looking for alternatives. I mean, but, but to do retail politics in a district, that's geographically huge. I mean, you're talking about a tremendous commitment and you only have uh, just a few months right, to get it done. That's all I have, that's right. So how do you do it? Do you get in the car? Do you, do you have, have you got a campaign base of people to help you with, an organization? We are putting together a campaign staff right now and what we're basically doing is putting together a list of events uh, where we think that the voters would be more inclined to my message than to my opponent's message, and I'm going to those events. And I'm trying to get as many of those speaking events uh, and, and maximize my exposure as possible. Now, you're talking about going up against a guy, obviously, who's, who's largely thought to be untouchable. But the best way, I think, probably to get, get some traction is to get him in front of a camera and debate him is, have you even tried to get him to... De I know historically he and over before him, they're not, they weren't big on debates. They did him if they had to. How do you get that guy in front of a camera and debate him? Good question. Uh, golden rule of politics is that, is that if you are ahead, uh, you, you don't want to debate because all you can possibly do is lose. Uh, I'm running as a libertarian, so there's probably uh, been a sense of, oh, I don't, I don't have to worry about Tom Simmons because he's a minor party candidate. Um, and I think he's going to find that that's going to change this year. Well, I said it in my column. I mean, there, there are certain you know, candidates that are just token opposition, like you know, Rosenberg has token opposition every once in a while in the state Senate and other you know, entrenched incumbents. But what I like about you is he's never going to see you coming. I mean, you are the antithesis of any candidate that Richie Neal has ever faced before because you have a knowledge of issues, but you also aren't afraid to say what you think. And that, I think, is what... More than anything else, people are craving in politics. That's why Trump is doing well, why Sanders is doing well. The two guys who are really saying what they think are leading all the polls. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's how I've been my entire life. So, Well, let's talk about some of the issues. Now, one of the things, according to your campaign website, that you're most opposed to Neil on is his position on standardized testing. Now, as an 18-year teacher, you know, as well as anybody, what public school teachers go through these days. Talk about why you're opposed to the standardized test and do we not have to have some kind of a standard? Okay, um, some, some type of standard? Absolutely, I was raised in New York. We had New York State's Regents Finals every year um, in a variety of subjects uh, and that's the way that, that I grew up. In 18 years of teaching here in Massachusetts, I will often have a conversation with my students in my economics classes in particular uh, about uh, items of, of history, World War II events, literature, um, the arts, and I get blank stares very often. And I'll ask them kind of rhetorically, didn't you ever cover this in, in high school? And they, they respond very honestly, no, we didn't. This is not anything we covered anymore. So is there a problem? Absolutely there is a problem. But when you further talk to the students, and when you talk to the teachers in the school districts, there's actually agreement. They don't cover these topics because they don't have time to do those topics. They're not allowed to. They're not allowed to. Uh, the entire, from uh, No Child Left Behind right through Common Core, um, is based on tying money to schools based on the test. And so, as often happens in politics, um, it's not just, well, let's test the students to make sure they know what they should know. Now there's an entire corporate industry that has risen around this. Hi, we're the XYZ textbook company. We have the textbook. We have the practice tests. Just buy our package and put it in front of the kid's face. And as long as they can do this, uh, they will, you know, they'll, they'll pass your tests. And by the way, the money your school district gets is going to be tied to the results of those tests. Yeah. Now, Richard Neal has been one of the biggest proponents in Washington of tying funding to schools to the outcomes of standardized tests. So that means that every school district in, in Massachusetts is, is operating under this cloud of if we don't get the kids to get this grade on this test, we're in trouble. Because if they don't, it reflects back on us, it reflects on our funding. 
the, uh, the uh, matrix of, of record keeping, of score keeping, of demographic keeping that has to be sent to prove that you've done all the right things have taken teachers away from what they love doing, yeah. which is teaching and which is pulling together history and the arts and political science and, and the sciences and, and making them alive in a unit and exciting. And it's boxed them into give this test, do this paperwork, send this paperwork, keep these records. The best learning I ever did, the four best years of education I ever had were in private school. And it was a private school right here in Deerfield. It was Eagle Brook School from sixth grade to ninth grade. And the reason why it was so great is I learned stuff at a level and from teachers, small class sizes obviously helped, but they could do what they wanted. It was free form. There wasn't this, you know, you have to do it this way. You have to do it within this amount of time period. Let, let them be educators. Don't, you right. know, let's, let's, let's focus on what we're supposed to be focusing on, which is teaching critical thinking. And as a college professor, I want to get your perspective on this because one of the th complaints I always hear is kids are coming out of high school going to college without basic skills, writing, reading skills, math skills. Do you find that to be the case with your students? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I know at, at Greenfield Community College, or where I teach and have taught, upwards of 60% of the students coming into the system, uh, place, they take placement tests, right. place at below college readiness in English or math. And that's, again, that's not a criticism of the teachers or the students in, uh, in the high schools, in the area high schools. The system has become one that rewards politicians and rewards large corporate textbook companies and doesn't engage in teaching anymore. I have six children. Some went to public school, some went to private school, some were homeschooled. Um, most of them were a combination of them. And children naturally want to learn. Uh, but it's not learning is, it, is the answer B or C. It's, it's combining different disciplines and engaging in critical thinking and giving them the confidence to question something, which many students don't have the confidence to do anymore. The critical thinking is so crucial because I, you know, I, I read stuff online all the time and, and I see people, that, someone will, will post something on a Facebook site and people will just, you know, hook, line and sinker without ever thinking, was well, this real? Is, you know, you can put anything on social uh, yes. media and people drop, you know, drop that hook in their mouth and by the time it's in their belly, they don't know which end is up and they can't figure out what's real and what's not. And that's a real scary thing. Well, and, we, and we've become, and, and I joke with my students about this, we've become the hashtag generation. Yes. I'll ask for a, a paragraph answer and I get a word. <laughs> like a Chinese pictograph, it, that word is supposed to convey some type of meaning. There's no thought that can only be contained to 140 characters that's a word. No, there isn't. Minute. There isn't. But, but that's what our politicians are doing right now. They're having tweet wars. So here's the question, Congressman in waiting, if you get there. What do you do about it? I mean, if you're going to have to have standards in education and you're not going to use a test, how do you measure what's, go, what's working and what's not? Standards are best met at, the, at a local or maybe a state level. If we go back to the 1980s, um, I was, I was living in New York at the time. Harlem, New York, one of the worst school districts in the entire state of New York. Uh, they had the lowest high school graduation rate, the lowest college attendance rate in the entire state. Parents and teachers rose up and said, we've got to change this. We've got to do something different. And the state and the city said, fine, we will let you use your own curriculum instead of the state imposed curriculum. We will let you basically teach the way you want to teach to your students. And I think everyone thought this was a big joke and would never work. And what happened was the teachers who wanted to teach were able to bring exciting information to the classroom. The students were engaged. Right now, Harlem has a waiting list for teachers who want to teach in Harlem. Their graduation, graduation rate is one of the highest in New York City. And their college attendance rate is one of the highest in New York City. It worked. We have seen it work elsewhere. But you've got to set teachers free to be able to, 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 um, to do what works for their students in their community. Now at the same time, New York State Regents still exist there. Yeah. But the teachers weren't teaching to the test. They were teaching students how to think and how to love learning and how to, in, how to incorporate the different disciplines together and come up with a rational argument. And because students could do that, they could pass the tests. You mentioned Common Core before, and that is one of those 
buzz phrases that I don't think a lot of people fully understand what it means, but it gets people all riled up. Yes, it does. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and should the federal government, it sounds like you're taking a libertarian position in that education should be handled by the individual states, not the federal. Should, should the government get out, the federal government get out of the education business? The federal government should be out of the education business. It is not their business constitutionally. Um, what, again, what it's turned out to is we'll take your tax money and then we'll give it back to you if you do exactly what, what we want you to do with it. Um, and it's not working. And the evidence that it's not working is just looking at what's happening in, a, in high schools across the country. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to some other issues that you will have to deal with if you are, in fact, elected to the next Congress. Uh, Republicans, I don't know how many times they've voted to repeal Obamacare, but it's got to be in the 30s, I think. Uh, that's going to come up whoever gets in the White House, and we'll talk about that later, too. Uh, but what are your thoughts on universal health care and Obamacare specifically? Does it have to be overhauled? Is it working? Is it not working? Would you have voted for it if you were had the opportunity in Congress? Actually, well, I, I probably wouldn't have voted for it because I wouldn't have had the time to read the entire document <laughs> from the time it was actually printed to the time they actually had the vote on Christmas Eve. Um, there are aspects of it that I think are critically important, that I really do like. The, uh, the portability of your health care, if you're changing jobs or losing jobs, the ability to keep your own children on your health care policy beyond the age of 18. There are some really solid elements of it. Um, I do not like the fact that the government is telling you you must purchase a product from a private company, and if you don't do it, we're going to punish you for it. Unconstitutional. Um, I mean, it's unconstitutional. Uh, it, it, it absolutely it violates full faith and credit and a whole bunch of other things. It, to me, there should be, I do believe, in universal access to health insurance. And that's different from we're going to cram you into a system. You don't, you don't mess up the insurance that 80% of the people have that's working in order to get another 10% into the system. If each state is permitted to create and authorize a nonprofit corporation, then you can provide the underserved individuals within that state with, an, with a, a nonprofit corp that actually uses the, the revenues received to, to, cover the, uh, to cover the expenses incurred. That's how I would provide f for, for access for anyone. Now that's sort of the model Massachusetts is operating under, and that, we were the first state to have that. But there are also those that feel like this still, you know, the federal plan, much like the, the Massachusetts plan, was a real sort of a, a kiss to the insurance companies. They're the ones making oh, it on Oh, it absolutely was because they're forced, the government is forcing you to purchase something from them. And they're, if you go on to the database and you say, you know, here's my information, they tell you, here is your provider. Um, so you're, you're not having choice in the marketplace. You're being told you must have health insurance and you must buy it from this person. Having access, universal access, does not mean I have to be forced into it if I don't want it. Right. And be penalized. I mean, if, if you don't secure a plan and insurance, whether it's affordable or not, then you get whacked on your taxes. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. The people least able to afford insurance, once again, the people least able to afford something are the ones who are going to get, get whacked mm -hmm. on their taxes. As long as we're talking about ideology a little bit, and, and you know, I, I, saw, I heard some Republican in there, I heard some Libertarian in there. It, it's, you strike me as someone who's a lot like me in that you look at every situation for what it is. You're not ideologically entrenched. Is that a fair statement? I'm not, well, I'm certainly not entrenched in either the Republican or the Democratic camps. I, if, if you speak to my friends, there are some who think that I am a wild-eyed right-wing nut. You speak to other friends of mine, I am a left-wing radical socialist commie pinko. And part of the reason for that is because my approach is always to value the rights of the individual. I don't want Republicans' noses in my bedroom. I don't want Democrats' hands in my wallet. People need to be able to live their own life their way. As long as they're not hurting anyone else, then the nanny state's got nothing to say about it as far as I'm concerned. And so there are many issues I come at from the left, and there are many issues I come at from the right, but it's all based on, on, on the sanctity and the value of the individual in society. What I find interesting is it, it seems like, like you look at it from the Republican side, they want to get involved in things that are deeply personal, like abortion, like the rights of, of same-sex couples to marry, 
but don't touch, you know, don't touch our taxes, don't raise our taxes, you know. The, the federal government's a nice tool until it's not for certain exactly. people. Yeah. Exactly. And, and Democrats will do the reverse on the same issues. Um, let's talk a little bit about some social issues because you, you know, you are, are, are I consider a very eclectic person. You're, you don't fit the typical mold of a politician. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and I also think, you know, unlike a lot of people in politics today, you're actually involved in, as a, you're a Coast Guard reservist, right? A Coast Guard auxiliary, yes. Auxiliary. So how does that experience help give you a better perspective as a candidate, you think? It's very consistent with my, with my volunteer approach. Um, the, the Coast Guard Auxiliary is unique to the Coast Guard. The other branches of the service don't have an auxiliary. And it, it functions like a reserve. I have to go through all of the same trainings. I take all the same tests. To, I'm qualified the same way as someone who is in the actual Coast Guard. But my service is voluntary. I don't get paid for it. Uh, I can say no if I'm, if I'm called up. Uh, I try not to do that very often, but it is volunteer service to the community. Um, so the, the notion of volunteerism has always been very big with me, and it's, uh, I joined the auxiliary because um, largely after 911, I was looking for a way to serve more than I was. My, uh, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were all fire chiefs, volunteer, really? okay. they all serve that way. Um, I had been looking at joining the military when I was younger, but because of the ban on gays in the military, I could not, and I chose not to lie and not to go in. Um, but in the last few years, that's opened up. So now I'm, now I'm doing what I wanted to do you know, back in the 1980s. As, as a, a gay person, are you, are you encouraged by what you're seeing with the discussion? I mean, 25 years ago, the discussion of transgender rights would never have happened, and now it's, it's actually a, a front page mainstream issue. And do you feel like people are, I guess the younger people coming up, it's not a big deal. The older folks still have a tough time with alternate lifestyles, but it seems like issues like gay marriage for the younger generation are not issues. It, they're not. For, for, for younger people, and for a lot of, even a lot of older people at this point, it, it's no longer an issue. It's been put to bed. Now, just like Brown v. Board of Education, when we desegregated schools, there was always an element of, of resistance. Um, and, and that happens with, with all social change. Um, but I'm very, very heartened by the, the changes I've seen in my lifetime that I thought would never, ever happen. Yeah. If, you, if you told me that two gay men or two lesbians could marry uh, in my lifetime, I would have laughed at you. Things are moving really, really fast. Shouldn't that be a federal thing, though? Shouldn't the Supreme Court take this on finally once and for all? I mean, so many states have had to do it. Or is it, is it really a state's well, issue? And, and they have taken it on, uh, the Equal Protection Clause. Um, so now it is, a f in 50 states, you can get married. End of discussion. Just like Loving, in Virgi Loving versus Virginia said, in 50 states, blacks and whites can get married. So they have taken it on. But yet you still have states like Oklahoma, which just recently passed a bill outlawing abortion, even and, though federally it's allowed. And you, you know what? They're poli political posturing, yeah. as so often happens. And it's going to happen on all of these bathroom bills that are coming up now. It's political posturing, because there's no way that the Oklahoma statute is going to stand. It's not going to stand. It's over. It's settled law. Move on. But there are politicians who want to you know, go home and tell, uh, you know, feed red meat to... Uh, uh, to their constituents. But how do you get past that? I mean, don't we have to find a way to reach across the aisle? I mean, is that, maybe, is a third party like the Libertarian Party, is that the answer? Somebody's going to put pressure on these left and right guys to smarten up, it seems like. In my, in my dream world, <laughs> in my dream world, we'd have a Libertarian president with one House of Congress controlled by the Democrats and one controlled by the Republicans, and they would have to work together yeah. to make things right. Oh, that, that Amer would... I'll tell you, Americans are, by and large, they are fiscally responsible and they are socially tolerant. That is who Americans are across the board. You just described the middle of the road people who, who don't have a dog in the fight. And ideology. that's where the Libertarian Party stands. And that's where I think most places, most victories, especially in national elections, are won in the middle, not in the left or the right. Well, that's right, because you're, you're well, it was a number of years ago, it was only maybe 10%, 15% of people considered themselves independent. And that would swing a state. That would make the election. 
because you had 40% Democrats, 40% Republicans. Far fewer people are embracing the, the major political parties now, and far more are saying, we're tired of this. We need, we need something different. We have just scratched the surface with Tom Simmons. I'm going to have you come back for a second uh, bite at the apple because there's so Be much stuff to. I still have to talk to. My guest has been GCC Economics and Business Professor Tom Simmons. He is a Libertarian candidate for Congress in the 1st Congressional District. I am Chris Collins. That's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time with Part 2 with Tom Simmons. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.